is really a pleasure uh, to have today Professor Matthias Nisner to talk at the Vision Seminar. Dr. Nisner is a professor of computer science at the Technical University of Munich, where he leads the Visual Computing Lab. And before that, he was an assistant professor at Stanford University. His research lies at the intersection of computer vision, graphics, and machine learning, with a focus on 3D reconstruction, semantic 3D understanding, and video editing and AI-driven video synthesis. He has published uh, in more than 70, like more than 70 academic publications in top conferences and journals, many of which have won uh, best paper awards and several awards. And his research has been widely featured in the media, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, MIT Tech Review, and multiple appearances on TV, including uh, an appearance in Jimmy Kimmel's live show to showcase a super popular method on face-to-face, -face, which was the first method doing facial reenactment in real time using RGB. The video of that work on YouTube has been watched over 5 million times. Uh, Professor Nisner has won many, many awards, including a Google Faculty Award and an NVIDIA Professorship Award, and the prestigious ERC starting grant in 2018, and also the Eurographics Young Researcher Award, honoring the best upcoming graphics researcher in Europe. And on top of all of that, uh, Professor Nisner is also a co-founder and director of Synesthesia, a startup backed by Mark Cuban that aims to empower storytellers through AI-driven video synthesis. Welcome, Matthias. It's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thanks a lot for the for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, it's actually it's a it's a real bummer. I would have been really nice to be there in person, um, but I guess we have to we have to make the best out of the of the situation we are currently in. Um, yeah, in this talk, um, I want to I want to talk about um, I want to motivate why neural rendering is cool. I don't want to only talk about you know oh we do deep learning and deep learning is going to solve solve everything, but I wanted to motivate it more actually from a graphics perspective. Um, why is it cool? Well, you see already a couple of examples here. Um, you can see we can do things like normal viewpoint synthesis, scene editing, animations, and all these kind of things. And um, I wanted to motivate it again from a more classical standpoint and see why specifically the learning algorithms make a lot of sense to be used here. Uh, those who don't know me yet, um, um, we basically, I'm um, in my group, um, I've been in Munich for about three years now. Um, we do a lot of 3D reconstruction, RGBD reconstruction, um, semantic scene understanding. We've done a lot of stuff on, on 3D deep learning, you know, figuring out semantic instance segmentations, um, ideally in real time, done a lot of stuff on the Kinect. Um, and, you know, we want to use these semantics um, in order to figure out for machines what they can do, um, not from an RGB standpoint, but more from a, you know, geometric standpoint. Um, the second big topic we're working on is um, AI-driven video synthesis, and this is also um, uh, what I'm going to talk in this talk a, a little bit more about. It's basically, you know, can we use, for instance, an existing video? Can we edit that video? Or can we synthesize the video from scratch? And I believe these two directions, they're kind of complementary. On one hand, you want to basically understand um, what's in a scene. And on the other hand, you want to be able to synthesize, you know, the imagery and so on. And, and these two things, eventually, I hope they will, they will get closer and closer together. In a sense, you know, once you can synthesize stuff, you also understand things. So that's kind of a, um, I think a very important synergy that I think we should more work as a community to connect these two things. So in this talk, I mostly want to talk about the, the, the second aspect here, but I actually don't want to talk too much about you know, specific methods. I want to rather motivate the higher level problems, the trends in the community and so on. So one of the big motivating factors is 3D digitalization right now. That's a motivation in, in computer vision, that's a motivation in computer graphics. And, and we want to go ahead essentially you know, take a photo, we want to we want to memorize something, but we don't just want to memorize static images. We want to like get an interactive 3D environment, right? We want to, we want to memorize it. We want to show it to somebody else. That person ideally would love to, um, you know, go through the same environment, have a photorealistic preview. Meetings like these still have meaning of it, you know, immersive enough. We're still missing some sort of engagement. And when we're talking about 3D digitalization, um, I always like to start by, you know, I'm originally from the graphics community. I like to, to show some images from graphics. So these are images that modern computer graphics methods can generate um, with ray tracing techniques. Um, and what they do is basically they take a 3D model, right? Um, they apply some rendering method. In this case, it's a ray traced image. And they can produce pretty realistic images. If I'm looking at a lot of you know, papers in computer vision, I most of the time see results would look like this. And, and this is not here to, you know, um, to discredit the computer vision community. Um, this is more um, showcasing that in computer vision, the aspect is, is more the opposite, right? In, in, in a sense that you're trying to take the image and trying to go back to the 3D representations and so on. 
But if you're taking then some renderings of these 2D representations, you will very quickly realize that they don't look so pretty. Um, and the following, I would like to think a little bit about why, why don't they look so pretty. And I think in order to get there, the first important thing is how do we actually generate images? Like in computer graphics, this is a process that is very well understood. There's like the seminal paper uh, from Jim Kachia in, in 86, the rendering equation that defines the light transport, right? So if I have a 3D scene, if I have all the content being defined, I can, you know, I can take a, a 3D model. In this case, that's a subdiff model. Um, I, I, I can evaluate it at certain points. I get some surface, right? I can shade it. Um, I can texture it and I can set a camera point and then I get a 2D image, right? So this process has been, has been studied over almost the last half century, right? Like, um, and we've been becoming pretty good at it right now. We, we can pretty much figure out how we go from a 3D representation into an image. And assuming we have, um, yeah, we, we have good 3D representations, um, these images can be photorealistic. Now, in practice, it sounds pretty good, right? If so all I have to do, I have to go to the 3D representations. Now, in practice, that's a bit harder because this whole 3D content is actually expensive to obtain, right? If you're looking at a, at a video game or a movie, um, you have like hundreds of artists. They're going to go ahead and model the geometry for you. They're going to model the textures on top of it. They're going to model the lighting and the material and so on, right? So it's a very, very consuming process. And um, again, if you're looking at the credits of a, of a video game or a movie, you have maybe like, I don't know, 10, 10 engineers who do the coding for the renderer, and maybe you have 500 artists to figure out how to model the 3D geometry. And of course, it would be really, really nice if we could use computer vision techniques in order to get this content for free. And for free, I mean, just take a bunch of images from a real world scene and get there. And there was, you know, this is a very popular example in computer vision, building Roman in a day, very popular paper like 10 years ago. Um, it doesn't quite get you there. And the reason why I think it doesn't quite get you there is like all of these structure for motion and multi key stereo methods, they all are, they are not really understanding the rendering process. They're not, they're not looking at the, at the simulation process of what the light is doing. Instead, what we do is we, we find a bunch of features, we find correspondences, and then we run some bundle adjustment later on, right? That gets us pretty much these results. But the, the, the thing what I would like to people encourage to do is actually look at computer vision as the inverse of graphics, right? So we had this rendering equation, um, we have this integral, and the big question is, can we invert it actually? And I wanna show you, it is partially possible. It is of course a very difficult problem. Um, if you're starting from a 2D image, right, you want to go ahead and get the geometry that was rendered to the image and it's constrained such that every pixel is eventually leading to this rendering. You have a 3D, uh, uh, 3D representation and so on. And in this case, the 3D representation, of course, would be the unknown. And one thing we've been doing very recently, actually, is we've looked at trying to simplify this problem a little bit. So in this case, we're saying, assuming you do have the geometry, assuming you do have a series of RGB images that are being aligned, so the process is being solved for you, um, the geometry is given to you, can we optimize for certain things of the rendering equation? Right? Can, we, can we, for instance, optimize for the material and the lighting parameters? And it turns out what you can do is you can do um, inverse path tracing. Um, so this was actually a, a project with um, uh, Zumao Li. He was, he was in Fredo's group. Um, he was doing an internship at Facebook, so he was working with us. Um, we are doing basically taking the rendering equation and trying to optimize for the underlying 3D representation by shooting rays, right? So all we're doing is we're shooting rays, we're computing gradients for every ray with respect to the underlying uh, unknowns of the 3D representation. Again, geometry is given, poses is given, um, and what we're looking for is lighting and the material parameters. And this inverse path tracing process in principle is pretty straightforward because you have the only thing you have to do is you need a differentiable path tracer. Um, you take the images, you shoot a bunch of rays, um, you're computing derivatives with respect to lighting and material. In this case, we use an SGD optimizer, which is funny enough. Um, then we update our materials. We go back, right? Um, and we, we just iterate this process a couple of times until we get to the parameters that we're looking for. And What's interesting about this is we didn't actually use any machine learning here, right? We just literally use um, the optimizer for machine learning. It confused a lot of people out in poster presentation CVPR, like using SGD, it has to be deep learning, trust me. 
Um, but it didn't, right? We just used it as an optimization framework and it worked actually surprisingly well um, in order to get um, the material and the lighting parameters. And this worked actually pretty well, assuming you had good geometry given, right? If you have good geometry given, um, in this case, we use the Disney BRDF. It's a relatively simple lighting um, and shading model. And um, we get pretty good results. And then we can do like mixed reality applications like these ones. We have here an input image, right? We estimate the lighting parameters, the uh, material parameters, and then you can, can, can put in virtual object in this. So this is a thing that worked really, really well for us when we have the geometry given. And we thought, hmm, yeah, let's do a follow-up project and let's now also optimize for the geometry. So we tried that too, but unfortunately, this is a thing that horrendously failed. This, probably many people have tried that and maybe we were a little bit too naive at this, um, but optimizing for the geometry is a pretty tricky situation because now you suddenly have discontinuities with occlusions and stuff like that. And then, you know, the optimization problem becomes a lot harder. So the question is, how can we address that? And that's the thing, what people have done actually for quite a while. So whenever you have these optimization problems for geometry, most of the time what people do is they, they figure out image formation models. So they, they, they want to they wanna have triers in the rendering process that can constrain the geometry. So you don't just have a triangle soup anymore, but you rather have a constrained model. And this is the thing what also people have been learned, but they didn't learn it just with deep learning. And they learned it with all kinds of statistical models. In one specific example, we've been working a lot in my group, um, is faces. For faces, this is a very well understood problem because you can go ahead um, and look at face databases. You can go ahead and compute statistical models, right? You can um, scan a bunch of people, align the faces, you compute like a PCA basis or so, and that's already a good image formation model. And the idea of this image formation model is that you can feed in a bunch of parameters here as input. So you have a rigid pose, right? You rotate the mesh, of course. Um, you have a bunch of shape identity parameters, you know, that makes the face bigger, smaller. And with all of these principal components here, you can basically define the identity of the person. Uh, you can go ahead and have materials and reflections, right? Um, in this case, it's a diffuse BRDF, but of course you can also add specularities. It's not such a big deal. Um, you can add things like expression parameters. That's uh, post specific parameters. Um, and at the end of the day, you can also do some lighting parameters in your model. Um, and you see it here at the bottom. Let me see if this thing with my laser pointer works. So here we have basically pose, identity, material, expression, and lighting, right? You have like maybe a few hundred parameters that define your, your image formation model, right? And these parameters now, they basically replace a triangle mesh, right? So this is a very constrained model. So we have a pretty big prior of the, the form of a, of a face. Um, and the idea now is, um, can we figure out these, these parameters P that define the face model and fit that to a respective image, right? Again, we wanted to do this inverse rendering process and we wanted to go ahead from this, like, um, from this model that, that is being created right now with, with M of P, so M is our model, P are our parameters. And what we want to do is we want to take an image here as input and we want to, to optimize for the parameters P that minimize this equation. In other words, we want to make sure that you know, every pixel here that in our model that we're rendering is expressing um, whatever we are seeing uh, in, our, uh, in our source image, right? And, you know, once, once every pixel matches of our model with our input image, then we've done a good job. Then, you know, our, our reconstruction kind of is complete. Um, the question is, how do you optimize that? Um, optimization, in this case, we've been doing with analysis by synthesis. That means um, it's pretty naive, actually. We just go ahead and render the model with an initial parameter set P. We compute the difference between the rendered and the target image. We have a differentiable renderer that tells us how should we update the model parameters. Um, and then we just start over again and we re-render, right? And we continue this process until we're minimizing that equation. Um, there's a few things um, in detail we have to define, right? Like how do we define these differences? We have color consistency. In this case, we use um, distance in RGB space. It's an L21 norm. Um, we use some distance in image space uh, from the features, right? That gives us some, some regularization. It's a market term. We have, um, in this case, we use a Saragi tracker, but nowadays we use something like open, open uh, face or so, right? Um, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be so accurate. It just has to roughly align it. Um, you regularize it. You say, don't deviate too much from the average face. Um, but all in all, this maps to a course to find Gauss-Newton optimization problem. 
you can optimize it on the GPU. Um, it runs in real time. Um, and the important thing is the gradients you can get through the differential rendering. In this case, differential rendering means I have this parametric model of the face, right? I render it and I get partial derivatives with respect to all of the model parameters I've shown you before. Now, if you're doing that, you're going to get results that look like this. Um, you can track the face in, in real time. Um, you basically want to make sure that every, every pixel here on this model matches everything here in the input. And this is pretty nice. Um, in this case, you know, from our holy grail of, of getting a full reconstruction of the, um, of the face here, we've achieved quite something. We've achieved that we have a model that we consistently track over time, and we have a 3D representation. But the thing we immediately see is, of course, we didn't reconstruct like the whole head here, right? We're missing a lot of pieces. So in this case, our models, our priors, they're all going to be incomplete, right? We're missing, we're missing the mouth region, we're missing the hair, we're missing the teeth and everything, right? Basically, a lot of things are missing. And these are all the things that we couldn't fit so easily in our, in our uh, parametric model. So we had to do something else. And, and that's the thing in computer graphics people have been doing for quite a while. Basically, they say, well, you know, you can't get the full reconstruction. Um, so what you do instead is we, we kind of hack the rendering process. So we've modified the rendering, and traditionally speaking, what people have been doing, and we did the same, you're just looking at some image-based rendering technique, right? So you're just warping frames together and to get a nice mouse shape or so. And this is what the um, the face-to-face -face paper in this case has also been doing, right? You, you have like a, a 3D model, you texture it, you have a mouth proxy that you're fitting in there, you have some non-rigid warp of the mouse background you're fitting in there, and you, you're warping it, uh, you, you're overlaying on top of the RGB. So that's all relatively straightforward. Um, for the mouth, you can do a couple of other things. You can also have some retrieval-based method. Um, you, you blend them together. And this is very tedious, by the way, if you implement that. This is a thing that costs you a lot of time, and it's very unsatisfactory, um, because it really depends on the image quality, what data you have, and so on. So you know, in order to publish a paper this way, it takes a lot of effort. Um, to figure out all of these. You can do that. Um, if you're combining all of these things together, you get results roughly like these. Um, we have here the input, right? We have a bunch of markers. And you can reconstruct the geometry, albedo, and texture. You can render now the 3D model on top of the output. And here's the composited target, right? Um, so I hope, I hope you can see this via Zoom. Um, that here, basically, we have now the teeth is overlaid, right? And and ideally, this image here looks the same as this image, um, but now this is a re-rendering, actually. So if, if these two look the same, then we've done a pretty good job. Um, so that's kind of the reconstruction, right? So we, most of the things we want to express with our model, and the rest we kind of you know, hack in a sense that we, we use some image-based techniques. Um, you know, and now you can do all the fun things with it. So now we, we can do reenactment. Uh, we can go ahead and say, oh, we duplicate this pipeline. We track the source and the target. Um, and because we have this intermediate 3D model, we can go ahead and say, oh, we have these expression parameters of the source, and we modify the target to get a modified image or video at the end of it, right? So this is the target that we want to edit. We want to use his expressions here, and this is the modified output. And this is basically what the face-to-face -face paper became. Um, the face-to-face -face paper now can go ahead and has a, a webcam, <coughs> has a webcam here, right? We're tracking his face, we're reconstructing it. Um, and we can we can go ahead and reenact the target video. Now this is a thing um, we thought. Well, this works great for faces. Let's just go ahead and do it for other body parts. So we thought, well, face looks great. Let's do it for the upper part of body for like you know Skype Skype meetings and, and video conferences. So we got results that look like this. In this case, we here have a source actor. Um, we track and reconstruct his his body. Um, we have a target actor. In this case, we reconstruct and track her body. And now we're going to do the same trick and say, oh, we have like a coarse reconstruction, and the texture is a few dependent warp um, of the images, right? So everything we can express in our model in this case, we simply um, we, we're simply doing in an image-based fashion, right? Uh, and then you get results that look like this. Again, we have here the, the source. Uh, we have here the respective reenactment, and here is the modified final target output. And yeah, you can do now fun applications. Now you can basically record yourself with with uh, with a suit, right? And then you can reenact yourself, and then you can be professional in your um, in your yeah in your, in your virtual Skype meeting. Um, also for the 
soccer fans, if you're in Munich, you will know that there's different teams in Germany and these are the good teams, these are not so good teams. Um, if you want to change your jersey, you can of course do that now too. You just record yourself in the right jersey and then you can be elected um, in, a, in a virtual fashion. Now, in principle, we thought, well, this is a cool idea, right? We can do this for faces, we can do it for upper bodies. Um, we could probably do this for a lot of other things eventually and publish a couple of more papers. Um, but we wanted to go a little bit higher level, right? And of course, there were a lot of other developments at the same time in the field. So we thought, well, how does this analysis by synthesis work, right? Whenever we can, I mean, I'm a big fan of doing reconstruction by this analysis by synthesis. Whenever we can synthesize, then we can um, fit, your, fit our model to the respective particles. So this works pretty well, but the model has to be flexible, right? So in other words, there has to be a P in our parametric model that can recreate the captured RGB input. This is an important thing. Like if, if, if there's no valid P and you can't express the target, that would be pretty cheap. The next thing is it must be optimizable. In other words, it has, you have to have a way to kind of convexify it locally. For the faces, we use kind of landmarks to get us close enough. We use a course to find optimization that makes sure we're not getting stuck locally. Um, for faces, this works pretty well. For bodies, it works too, but we tried this for hands and so on a little bit. And for hands, it's getting a bit trickier because you suddenly have a lot of occlusions and then you know it's getting a little bit harder. Um, but the big weakness, um, what we found in this line of work is this incompleteness, right? We always had to do basically have partially a 3D model, and then we had to do some image-based tricks in order to fix the 3D artifacts. Like everything that was not in the model was just an image-based thing. And this is the motivation why I think you know, rendering is pretty cool, because that's the thing what you can learn. So now we can go ahead and say, hmm, well, we take the strength of these analysis by synthesis reconstruction methods from traditional computer vision, um, but then we're using generative neural networks to learn the missing pieces that we can't express in this model. So we just say, well, most of it we can reconstruct, and the other things we just learn, right? Um, so that's kind of a nice, a nice combination of the strength of these two directions. So neural networks can actually um, do image synthesis, of course. We've seen a lot of work on GANs, right? If we over-parameterize a model, we, we can recreate an input that's very clear, right? Um, we've seen a lot of progress on GANs. This is uh, an example here from the progressive GAN paper from uh, NVIDIA did. Um, we've seen a, a lot of progress on conditional GANs, like, uh, like uh, Philip Isola's Pix to Pix is pretty popular, right? And all of these kind of works, they have shown tremendous progress. The challenge, though, for the most part, is the control is still tricky for most of these pieces, right? So if you have a standard GAN, you go from a latent vector Z and want to create an image out of it. Um, if you want to have a, a video, a consistent video, this becomes much harder, right? Because how, how do you do that, right? I mean, you, like you're generating frame by frame, but you have no temporal coherence given the consistency. So that's a big challenge with the GANs. Controllability is, I think, one of the, the big open challenges right now like how to make GANs very useful. And, but it turns out we can actually combine the two directions relatively easily. You can go ahead and say, I'm gonna go and take a target video. I'm gonna reconstruct the target video with whatever reconstruction pipeline, just using the face-to-face -face pipeline here. Um, we're getting a 3D model, right? We're getting um, illumination, identity, post expression, and ice. Ice is something I haven't talked about, but you can do it also with an eye tracker. Um, but basically, we get the three parameters of the model. And the idea now is we have this synthetic model. Previously, what we've done, we've now take, previously we've taken um, some image-based rendering techniques. But now the idea is we can simply replace the letter part here with the pix to pix model, right? You can just say, oh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and, and simply learn how to recreate realistic images out of these rendered results here, right? And this gets you, again, a fully controlled output because you have the explicit control via the 3D model. Um, and then you can also do the same things what you've done with face-to-face. -face. You can go ahead and have a source video, target video, you reconstruct both. Um, you're going to get some 3D model that you can combine with certain properties from here and here. Like for instance, you can take the expressions from the source and take them to the target. Now, one thing that is pretty interesting here, what's a little bit different to traditional GAN methods is this network here doesn't have to be a very strong network. This doesn't have to be a network that can do anything. Um, this just has to be a network that is overfitted to that target video. The only thing it has to do is, please make sure it generate me an image that looks like a frame from that video here. And it turns out this one you can train actually with 
maybe a thousand, maybe two thousand frames. You only need a short video sequence to actually train that, and it trains pretty fast. It trains in a few hours, basically, right? Um, so that's very nice. Um, and at the same time, we have the control that I mentioned with the condition. So if you're looking at some of the results, you're getting results that look like these ones. Um, you have here a source sequence, right? Um, and what we want to do is we want to take the expressions of him um, and the rigid motion of him. So now we can also change the head pose. Um, we're transferring the expressions and pose to the reconstruction of her. This is a re-rendering of her face with his expressions. And now we're running the, the pix to pix network here in order to generate an output of her video that is only trained on this specific video. And it looks like that. So the idea is basically, well, this one animates that one, and the network makes sure that out of these synthetic re-renderings, we're going to get realistic images again. What's kind of cool about it, I mean, this is, again, this is trained on a, on a few thousands of frames, like not, not tens of thousands. Um, you even see how the shadow moves along with it, right? The mouth is not quite perfect, but it looks already pretty decent. So it's kind of, it's kind of cool, right? Um, you can go ahead um, yeah, and take arbitrary other video sequences, right? You can go ahead and take this one here. Uh, we have here a source um, sequence. We have here the reconstruction of Obama. We can take his expression, his pose, and can modify it. But we have actually, now we have kind of combined the advantage of the two, two ideas, right? We can have full control with this proxy 3D model. And we have the advantage of a neural network that learns all of these kind of image-based tricks and so on, right? So we don't have to stitch stuff together manually and um, we, we can get results much quicker. Um, control, you can see here too, right? We can go ahead and do video editing. Um, and yeah, you get actually pretty good results with that. So I would argue this is close to photorealistic depending on the quality of the training. Um, yeah, this is a trick. Um, with these conditional GANs, um, we were, of course, not the only ones who thought of this. Um, these conditional GANs, you can, in principle, imagine all kinds of different input, right? Um, and one very popular paper was um, the Everybody Dance Now paper, of course, right? Um, the idea there was you, instead of using a face, you, you use a human skeleton, right? And But it's the same idea, right? You have this, this kind of control with a skeleton, and then you have the Kind of the photorealistic rendering you have with the with the with the conditional GAN. Um, I wanted to show some of the results. Um, like if you're slowing this one down, you see that some of the, especially in the arms, you see that the 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 pictures they jump a little bit around. And this is by no means I'm not saying like oh, this is not like fantastic work. On the contrary, I'm saying this is really great inside what's missing right now. The problem what we have here is the tracking of the original input was not perfect. If you trained everybody dance now with perfectly tracked, ideally synthetic data, then you would also get perfect outputs. But in practice, the human body trackers, they're not 100% they're not consistent, right? That's a, big, that's a big limitation. So as long as the tracking is not perfect, the neural network afterwards doesn't know how to make the correlation between the synthetic renderings and the real renderings, and it starts to create some um, imperfect results. The next big problem, what we realized, is the network has no explicit 3D notion. Um, this is the same for faces. For faces, it's a bit easier because you just have a planar, basically a plane, and you animate the plane. That's an, a straightforward problem. Um, for bodies, it's a lot harder. Ideally, we would also like to do clothing and hair, of course, right? But you know, we're not we're not quite there yet. And um, but the reason is also that there's no explicit notion in the network itself. So basically, what we're doing right now is we're running a series of 2D convolutions and trying to make sure that these convolutions, they learn a 3D, a 3D abstraction um, yeah, of, of whatever underlying 3D environment you want to capture. And we've trained a very simple novel two-point synthesis method to illustrate that. Um, this is just plain picks to picks trained um, on a spinning cube, and the conditioning is the viewpoint. So the only thing you feed in is the viewpoint, right? And the network should figure out um, on a short sequence here, it's overfitted to that sequence. It should figure out how you spin this cube around. And this is an incredibly hard example, of course, because you have all the fine scale text and you don't have so much training data. So you see all these like swimming artifacts here. And this is precisely happening because the network doesn't have any underlying 3D representation. Um, so now we looked a little bit at the network architecture. Uh, and this was this paper, Deep Voxels, um, it was a collaboration with Stanford. Um, the idea here is. We're saying, well, we have a 2D input. We're extracting some features in 2D. We're lifting these features to 3D. 
all the operations we know we're doing in 3D, and then we're reprojecting the features back to a target view, and this 2D network in the target view recreates a photorealistic output. Again, this one here is giving you some, um, yeah, some, some basic feature extraction. So it basically samples it down in the spatial resolution, but it gets you more features. And this one upsamples it in, in terms of the like 3D, uh, 3D operators that you can do in a box model. Um, the 2D unit then takes these features and recreates a realistic image at the end of the day. Um, but the key idea here is that this is a 3D operated, uh, these are 3D operators, and these projections here from, from the current viewpoint to the 3D volume and from the 3D volume back to the target image, these ones are non operators, and you can simply apply a rotation and translation matrix to the respective boxes. I simplified this pipeline a little bit here for illustration purposes. In practice, there's also a kind of a depth estimation network here going on. There's, um, there's a way you have to figure out um, how to do the projection. I'm ignoring this for convenience reasons right now, but I think what's pretty important is that we don't have to learn 3D operators. And I think that's a cool thing because of course we don't want to learn things that we already know. We can just use them and focus the network capacity in other, re in other regions or in other, in other means where we, we need to learn something. And if you're taking roughly a network with the same number of parameters, exactly the same training data, and you're comparing like the original pix to pix with the voxels, you see that in this kind of novel viewpoint synthesis example, you're getting actually pretty good pre-rendering results. Um, so you see, well, the text is pretty stable right now, right? Um, and we have much, much less swimming artifacts. So I'm not sure how well this is visible on Zoom right now, but if you're looking closely on the edges here, right now when the cube is spinning, in these cases, you still see some swimming artifacts. And the reason why you see them is because the voxel resolution is relatively small. In practice, that's basically the discretizations of the voxels that we have. And in this case, we use 32 qubits, just very low, right? So for this, even for the simple example, that's a very, a very bad uh, approximation in a sense. And, but it does get a lot better. But the big question is, how can we improve on that even further? Um, and well, the obvious answer is we need a higher resolution grid. The problem is, well, for volumetric grid in practice, it goes cubically, right? That's just how it goes. Um, that's just a less ideal, that's just a less ideal composition. So what we need is a better representation instead of a, a volumetric grid, right? And the way we get there is we using a mesh. Um, a mesh just uses a texture, right? And the texture you have, it, it grows quadratically instead of cubically. And this is what we've done in the neural texture paper. So the idea is we do the same thing what we've done in, um, uh, on a voxel basis, we now do on a mesh. So what we do is we have a um, 3D geometry. This is a, a reconstruction that we're getting with ColMap. It's a standard multi-view stereo reconstruction method. Um, we create a UV parameterization um, of this surface. And now we are storing, instead of RGB values on a per surface point, we're storing like neural pixels, which is essentially um, an n-dimensional feature vector per surface point. And when we are optimizing for novel viewpoint synthesis or something else, we're basically backpropagating um, into these features and trying to memorize the local appearance of the geometry, right? So in other words, the geometry is kind of broken. This geometry, you see it, it's a globe actually, it should be a, a world globe. Um, it's very blurry and the appearance locally is pretty bad. But the idea is that the neural textures can kind of memorize or learn, quote unquote, the, the, the appearance. And well, the way you're optimizing for that is, you're taking this 3D geometry with the UV map and the neural textures. You have a target view. You're rendering this 3D view into some 2D image, um, given a rotation and translation matrix. Um, with the UV map, you can sample the neural pixels. So this is just like, like a deferred shading, right? You, all you're doing is you're looking up um, the texture values. And now in image space, you're having the sample textures. Um, and then what you're doing is, um, you have a 2D unit that produces, or is supposed to produce a realistic image. So in other words, this unit takes these abstract neural features that are now being rendered into 2D um, and tries to make a photorealistic image out of it again. And the way you train that is, it's an end-to-end -end process. So this rendering part here is differentiable. So you know where every 
Hexel maps to the 2D domain. Um, so you can simply train this whole pipeline end to end. And what you're doing essentially is you're overfitting to a given target scene, meaning that for this target scene, you're getting the neural pixels, in this case for this globe. And then what you can do at test time, you can change R and T and create novel viewpoints. Um, yeah, in a sense, this is, we call this um, deferred neural rendering, right? If you're comparing it to, to, to graphics, in the computer graphics pipeline, what you have is you have a deferred renderer that renders you know, the normal map, renders the, the, the UV maps, right? Um, the depth, the albedo, lighting parameters, and so on, it renders it all into a 2D image. Um, but these feature maps are handcrafted, right? Like instead what we want to do now is we want to have this deferred null renderer and it learns kind of this abstract feature representation where we're hoping that for every texel it stores the local appearance. And we applied this for a couple of different um, uh, uh, targets. So we use novel viewpoint synthesis with this globe. That's what I've just shown you. I'll get this one as input and we get this one as output. We can do things like scene editing, but we can also do our classic or <laughs> favorite problem statement like animation synthesis. Uh, novel viewpoint synthesis, um, you get results that look like these, right? So we have here um, we have here a 3D reconstruction of this globe, but then we use the neural renderer here um, and, and making the image quote unquote look realistic. And in this case, it's very nice um, that all the 3D operations are encoded in the 3D model and the network kind of kicks in for all the things where the geometry and the appearance and the texture is broken. And we can get a very consistent um, video also. So there's no like temporal flickering artifacts and so on. Uh, we compare it here with the ground truth. Um, it looks pretty similar. Um, th there's, there's not really any artifacts, but in fairness, it's also relatively a relatively simple scene. Um, we've done this for scene editing. In this case, we can take, um, yeah, we have an input sequence again. We're running call map in this case to get a multiple stereo reconstruction. Um, that's what we're getting here. Right, we're optimizing for the neural pixels for the scene, and now what we can do is also we can just copy paste the geometry of this of the statue here. We have it twice, right? Um, and now we have a duplicate. We have three times the statue in here, and now we can do novel viewpoint synthesis from this kind of modified edited scene, and you get results that look like these ones. Again, here's the original, um, and here's the respective target output. And I can show it again can hear the input and the respective target output. Um, I think it's pretty cool, right? So now with the, with the underlying 3D representation, we not only need significantly less data for training because a lot of the stuff we don't have to learn, um, we also have kind of explicit control. Um, yeah, one weakness you will immediately see if you're looking closely, um, this statue here has a shadow and the other ones don't have a shadow. And there's a very simple answer why that happens is our differential renderer doesn't have any shadows. Right, so obviously one of the next steps would be to do something like again a differential path tracer or so and uh, combine these two ideas. We haven't done that yet, but this is kind of a, a natural expansion in order to get shadows and stuff like this. Right, um, same thing counts for other global in, uh, effects. Right, so again simple renderer, it's just a forward renderer, no global effect, so we don't get that. But I think the concept is kind of cool. Right, so this is why I think like yeah, no rendering in this case is really nice. Um, we can also do these kind of things for facial animation the same way we've done this before. Uh, so we have here a source actor, right? Um, we track his face. Um, we want to in-paint basically the region here of that face. Um, and the way we do this is um, we just simply uh, take the motion from here. We have the neural textures that are optimized for this target. And then we modify the 3D model based on the source tracking. And this is on the right-hand side is now fully generated with, um, with a neural renderer. So this looks already pretty realistic. Of course, we had a we had a lot of fun with it. Um, we started taking our favorite personalities. We joined you 15 years ago. We've been privileged to receive for the past few years. Um, and this kind of thing, we we took it a little bit further. So now we had um, we had a lot of control over it, right? Basically, we we have a, a synthetic model, a synthesis model that can create realistic inputs. One of the very recent things. Um, we've been looking at was conditioning on audio um, and doing kind of neural voice puppetry. Um, so I'm not sure how well you can hear actually the audio. I'm, I'm still going to play it. Um, these videos now are being 
same idea, but the conditioning now becomes the audio. So I'm not going to go into all the details, but you can now go ahead and um, and, and basically take audio input and uh, or text input. It works with text as well. You just type in text, then you have a text to speech synthesis method, and then you can create realistic output videos. Great. Progress by steps. Both of those steps are small, some are much bigger. Uh, seen from the outside, sometimes people have the impression that, oh, there's this big breakthrough, breakthrough, and Joe always likes the word breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough. But actually, science is very, very progressive. It's gradually understand better as well. Okay, so this is roughly what we've been doing on neural rendering. Um, I want to go one step back and I want to quickly recap a little bit of the things um, we've been discussing. Um, I think there's a couple of really interesting open challenges and um, um, I haven't been able to put in all the all the recent papers we had now into this talk, um, but there's a couple of more right now. Um, you, you are encouraged to look at, especially from this year's CVPR, which I guess is in theory happening in two or three weeks. We'll see how that goes. Um, but I think the, the high level thing, what's kind of interesting is how do we do this photorealistic reconstruction, right? How we do this digitization. Like traditionally, again, in computer vision, what we've been doing is like running structure of emotion, multi-view stereo, we're getting a 3D representation. But how do we get from these representations from here to realistic images again? And you know, traditionally speaking, we've been working we, as a community, we've been working on making that reconstruction better and better over the last 10 decades. But maybe we've been got, getting it somewhat wrong. Maybe we, we try to make the reconstruction better. Maybe we need to change simply the rendering pipeline, right? And this is kind of what neural rendering is doing for us. So in this case, we can say, well, we have this, like, um, here's an example. We have just a simple cube, so our reconstruction is pretty bad of this ways, but we can train a neural renderer that turns the random images from here into the base that we've trained it on, right? So we still maintain some control with the proxy, but the AI can help us to get realistic images out of it again. And of course, the, we're not the only one thinking about this, but this is kind of a very exciting question, like how, how much should the AI do? How much do we need to reconstruct on one hand? And how much need to, need to, do we need to do with a neural renderer as well? And this kind of synergy effect is interesting, I feel. Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't do better reconstruction. Maybe the solution is by doing better synthesis, we also can get better analysis by synthesis and get better models at the end of the day for free as an output. Um, there was very recently, there was this NERF paper from Berkeley, um, which is kind of cool. They don't do any learning, but they basically, um, they, they train a, a simple uh, fully connected network that memorizes kind of per scene the appearance. Sorry, per scene point in the appearance. Um, and at the end of the day, in principle, they get a good reconstruction out of it. So maybe, maybe that's also an interesting insight, right? So if I can do good neural rendering, I can go back and get a good 3D model at the end of the day. Maybe I have to get that, otherwise maybe it's not really possible. I would also like to encourage people um, to look at one of our recent state-of-the-art uh, report on neural rendering. Um, there's a lot of other people involved. This is not just for my group. Um, this was, um, uh, yeah, Chunyang was involved, for instance. Um, uh, Stanford was involved, Google and Facebook were involved. Um, this is kind of a, a recent survey we, we published at Eurographics this year. Um, I think it's a very good, uh, it's a very good overview of, of what the developments in that field was. Um, we've been doing a lot of stuff on faces, but again, like things on, on bodies, like what Everybody Dance now started is like extremely popular right now. It's really cool, right? Like even the follow-up papers, they, they look pretty decent actually. Um, so I think, you know, that, that development will just uh, continue to grow, I feel, and it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, I can I can talk about a few other things. Um, of course, video editing is, is pretty popular, as you might imagine. Um, uh, yeah, we, we've already heard it. We had a lot of press. <laughs> I guess, um, yeah, you, you have to make it on a late night show on computer vision as a researcher at some point in your life. Um, we also got invited by, by our, our federal government, um, which was pretty interesting. So these guys wanted to see you know, how, how, how dangerous are these things we're doing? Um, how bad is it? I should say we showed Merkel actually all of these results and we created a couple of videos specifically for her and she, she took it actually pretty well. Um, so that was pretty fun. Um, yeah, we also, have, um, we also had other politicians. We didn't talk to these ones yet, um, but we still made a lot of fun of them and we animated their face a little bit because you can do it and it's kind of interesting and it's kind of cute. Um, but of course, you know, with all the fun, with all the interesting things, um, I would also encourage everybody, of course, to think about the ethics, right? And, and this is a thing that we should be very well aware of. I mean, of course, you know, we in research, we understand roughly what we can do with it. 
Um, but specifically terms like deep fakes and so on have been appearing for quite a bit right now. And we should be very careful in how we communicate to the public um, what these methods can do. I mean, of course, right, we have very specific goals in mind. We want to do digitization of the real world. But of course, you're always going to get asked the questions and, you know, like, oh, how dangerous is it? Can you manipulate things and so on? And one of the big questions is also, like, how far are these methods right now? How convincing are they? And we did actually a study with about 200 participants. Um, these, were, these, were, um, these were master students um, in, at Munich. And we asked them, essentially, we showed them images of faces, and we asked them to, to tell us, are they real or are they fake? And um, this was a 50-50. It's a binary classification, so 50% 50, 50 here is random, right? If we're showing them good quality images, meaning that they, they were not compressed, they were just high quality renderings, people were roughly yeah, like 70% accuracy. So they could be, there's some signal. This one was roughly the compression that Facebook uses. So if you compress it to Facebook, um, like the, the real time feed compression, um, the, it was like 55% accuracy. So by the way, on a, on a binary classifier, 55% is pretty bad. Um, so in other words, um, for people right now, if you're just looking at this, even though you're being told this is something you should look out for, it's still, it's very tricky to see what's going on. And of course, this curve goes down. The, the more compression and the, the worse the quality gets, the harder it is to detect the things. Um, and one thing we've been um, developing along with the, with the methods itself, we've been looking at um, AI for detection, right? We had this, um, or we still have this, of course, this, this larger effort face forensics, um, which is first we started out with collecting a bunch of face-to-face -face videos, uh, but then we expanded it to all the state-of-the-art facial manipulation methods. And in, in, in this case, um, we collected about a thousand videos. Um, and in total, we have about 500,000 frames uh, in the source. Uh, we have the, the pristine frames. We use the deep fake method. We use face-to-face. -face, we use face swap, and we also use neural textures. And we, of course, we're gonna be uh, in the process of expanding this even further. So this is a benchmark that's available for roughly I don't know, like six, seven months now. Um, in total, it has over 200 million manipulated frames. We have various compression levels. We made sure we had a reasonable distribution of, of, of gender um, and pixel coverage of faces. Um, we already have about a 200, uh, 2,000 downloads um, from various research groups. So it's, it's pretty widely used for benchmarking in the forensics community. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of people using it right now in research papers. Um, also, very recently, we got an update, actually. Um, Google donated. Um, the deep fake detection data set. This was um, with Jigsaw and Google together. Um, this was mainly Chris Breckler's team who, who kind of donated to our face forensics effort another 3,000 deep fake videos. In this case, there were not so many actors, but there was a large variety of scenes. So there were a lot of different combinations for deep fakes. And yeah, this is kind of um, a data set that is online right now. We have a benchmark, people are submitting, um, we're running a couple of competitions and so on. Um, and then we use this data, of course, um, and we wanted to train um, neural networks and see how well do they do. And in this case, I mean, on a high level, the, the, the easiest thing we could do is we're running an input image, we're running a face detector and a face reconstruction method um, based on the reconstruction and the cropped image around the face, because that's the pieces that were manipulated. We're running a classifier, and the classifier tells us it's idealized. Now, um, yeah, don't, don't quote these numbers wrong, um, but I just wanted to compare it to the user study. So if you're running a user study, these were the numbers, right? And if you're running the AI on the good quality, that classifier gets pretty much 100%, I mean, like 99 or so, right? So in this case, if you have high quality image, this, this classifier is actually pretty good. If the quality gets lower, um, then it also drops, but it's still better than whatever the humans have been. But the reason why I'm saying don't quote it wrong, I don't want to say that, oh, AI is better than humans. I think we all know we still have a while to go there. Um, but I think in practice, it's still an interesting thing. If you're training, of course, a deep network on specific artifacts on a bunch of methods, then you can detect these things very well. So the kind of the, the high level conclusion here is if we have enough training data, we can detect it to a reasonable degree, especially if the quality is OK. This one is still at like seven. I mean, the state of the art here is a little bit higher now. Now we are at 84 or so. But even 84% on a binary classification task is actually not that good. Like, just imagine, you know, you have a billion images, you're 85% right. 
you still have a bunch of images leaving this label at the end of the day. So it's, it's a tricky problem. Um, we also were working with a nonprofit startup, um, AI Foundation, to release this as a browser plugin. Um, we are still thinking about it, but the problem is if we even have a bunch of false positives here, even if we had 98%, again, these 2% images that we wrong on a billion images would be a huge problem. So it's really difficult how to convey this. So this is one thing we are kind of struggling a little bit in, in, in an executional question what to do with it, right? But okay, but I think it's still a very interesting direction because I think ultimately the, the, the synthesis and the forensics, they kind of, they kind of, they help each other in a sense. I think. And this is one thing I also encourage researchers to look at. I, I like them to, to think about both sides, right? So if you can synthesize, you're better at detection because you can suddenly explain what are the things your model, your model doesn't cover. Also on the forensic side, um, well, of course, if I know what went wrong, I can synthesize better, right? So this is kind of an, an, an interesting um, kind of cat and mouse game. Um, a lot of people tell me it's, um, it's a hopeless effort to do forensics because, you know, eventually you can go into the scan setting and, um, you know, you can always then retrain your GAN and become better and better. Um, but I think fundamentally, we have to be very well aware that in principle, synthesis is harder. Like the output of a synthesized image is, is a much higher dimensionality than a binary classifier. But at the same time, the level of the, 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 the tolerance for error on the synthesis side is much lower, right? I can, I can have a bunch of artifacts and people think it's all right. But if I'm going to release a forensics application and I'm like only 70, 80% right, that's a big problem in practice, right? So, so that's an interesting question from a, from a research standpoint. I think on a high level, I think photorealistic reconstruction is, is a really cool thing. I think this neural rendering is, I didn't go into too much of the deep learning side. I know there's a lot of stuff happening at MIT. That's why I didn't want to cover too much there. But um, I, I mean, this is a really interesting direction, right? Because we know all the classical rendering things and we can now put these into, into neural networks and then we can use neural networks to figure out all the things that didn't work so well. So, I don't know, I could think about 20, 30 research um, ideas right now, just along that, um, going from lighting to dynamics to, um, to the geometry refinement and stuff like that, right? So this is kind of a really, a really, really interesting direction. I expect, of course, there will be, will be a lot more coming out in the, in the community. Um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm roughly through. Uh, I wanted to, of course, thank um, all the collaborators that have been working with me on that. Um, again, this is not, just my work, um, most notably probably Justus uh, Thies, who has, uh, who has been a, a lot of, his postdoc in my group right now, um, who has done a fantastic job, and all the collaborators from Stanford, Erlangen, um, uh, MPI, and so on. Um, I would also like to thank my own group. Um, we are currently still growing. <laughs> we, we currently have uh, 12 PhD students, actually. So hopefully, um, we will also make a little bit more progress on, on these sites. Cool, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I'm not sure what the format is. Do we have questions right now, actually? Is that a thing or? Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Matthias, for, for the amazing talk. And now people feel free to, to unmute to ask questions. Thanks a lot. I have a question. Okay. Yeah, this is Tim Marks from Merle. Hi, a wonderful talk, um, interesting work. My question is those, the graphs you showed, um, of the uh, machine uh, detection of the face forensics versus the human. You said that was on images rather than videos. Is that right? Yeah, I would think videos right. makes it a lot easier um, for humans and possibly for machines as well. Uh, have you done or, or thought about doing that as well? Um, <laughs> it's actually pretty funny. So for, for the machine learning techniques with current neural networks, um, you can, so basically if you're training neural network, right, the easiest thing is you take, um, whatever state-of-the-art classification network that is pre-trained on images or pre-trained on some face data set, um, you get a classifier on one image. Um, getting that number up by using multiple frames on videos is surprisingly difficult. It, the it training turns, like, data is the problem. Sorry? Training data is the problem for video? No, it's not. You have a lot of videos, right? You could, you could pre-train a lot of videos. Uh, most of the video um, networks like, um, what is this, like 3D ResNets and stuff like that, they are pre-trained on activity-based networks, uh, activity tasks, so you can do that. Um, you can run these 3D networks right away, but eventually you're making a sacrifice. You're making the sacrifice of saying, oh, do I have more layer? So you have a fixed amount of, of network capacity you're fitting on your GPU, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to make this interesting decision of, oh, is my network deeper or do I consider more frames at the same time? 
Um, if you're using more frames at the same time, we got this number up by like 5%. We went from like 85 to roughly 90. But it, it's surprising that it was so difficult to get it up. We also tried a lot of proxy tasks. Oh, let's predict flow at the same time. Let's make sure the motion happens at the same time and so on. So yes, you do get better results, um, but they're not significantly better what I would have hoped for. Let's put it this way. So video processing is still difficult with neural networks. And I think, of course, one, one reason is that our 2D networks, they are just so well pre-trained, right? We have just very, very good networks there. <laughs> and what about for humans? Does the video, I would think, would help the humans? Um, yes, the video actually does help. Um, we don't have the full user study. It was a little bit higher, but it wasn't like, it also wasn't like tremendously high. Huh. And, and the reason is um, we showed them, in this case, the video once. And um, it wasn't super fast. So it was basically, I think, seven, eight seconds or so what we showed. Um, and seven, eight seconds, if you don't know what you're looking for, what artifacts, as long as you don't have like a specular, flicker, a specular highlight that flickers or so, it's difficult to see. Um, for, however, for the researchers itself, um, if I ask Justus, he knows that. He knows exactly which artifact to look at. So if you're training a person enough, they get at much better at the videos, actually. Um, but that's not a fair example, I think, because in practice, you want to see, okay, you know people roughly who look at media, but it basically, they see this stuff once or twice, right? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Hi, Matthias. Um, this is Tony from, from MIT in Luca Garlone's lab. Um, thanks for the talk, it was amazing, but it was a bit discouraging on the geometry side of things, I would say. Um, <laughs> There's, uh, there's actually no work right now in your group uh, focusing on, on, that, on optimizing the geometry, meaning measures that, that you don't know the topology of, for example. Um, we actually focus on the geometry a lot. Um, I didn't put it in here right now because I wanted to focus on the appearance. Um, we have, I think we have three or four CDPR papers this year just on the geometry. Um, basically, one thing that seems to work relatively well is basically doing shape from shading with a combination of no networks, right? So you have like a coarse geometry and you're trying to learn an offset function locally that gives you a better representation. Um, for static scenes, if you have good poses, this works pretty well. If you have in dynamics right now, I mean, I'm super interested in doing it for, for hair and humans, right? Um, that is not working at all right now. I mean, I wish it worked better. <laughs> um, but, but of course, there's a lot of people working on it, right? It's a difficult problem. Um, I think ultimately we need to get better geometry, but I think the way we get there is by using something like neural rendering and having it in the inside loop and modeling the appearance. And then because we can synthesize it again, we can fit the model again. I think that's the ultimate thing how we get there. And I, I give it a try myself also in this end. So we, we just released the Chimera pipeline, which basically reconstructs the screen online and, and in real time. And I, I, I actually believe in, in that vision of just render and, and, and compute the, the errors that your model gets, right? But I was wondering how much of real timeness will I lose if, if I go that way? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I lose the, all of it, you know? If I, well, I, I think real time is cool. I like real time demos. Um, um, I think we should, everything should be real time. Um, Reconstruction has to be real time. If we ever want to get robots and, and inter human robot interaction right and so on, we have to get it in real time done. Otherwise, it's boring. Um, I, I think, I mean, it's a question, let's put it this way. The rendering processes, we are pretty good at getting it fast. If I have a forward renderer on a GPU that takes me less than a millisecond for these simple scenes, that's like absolutely no render time, right? Um, question is how fast are the optimizers and how many render loops do I need? If I have like a globally ray traced image, eh, it's getting a bit rougher. Um, but, but you see, like, there's like a lot of efforts in the rendering community. There's things like Mitsuba 2 came out. Um, Tumao Lee had this cool paper um, about the path tracing, right? These papers are coming out and they're, they're focusing a lot on the speed. They don't want to wait an hour. So if you're getting these kind of things fast um, and then coupled with better hardware, like NVIDIA RTX, right? Um, in, in principle, you should get the rendering loop down to sub milliseconds, I believe. If, if, if you can get that then you have a good chance of running this in real time. For face-to-face, -face, we do in real time, right? Like one, one iteration here takes less than a millisecond. Again, faces are easy in some way and hard in other ways, but in, in this case, it worked relatively well. I guess the bottleneck will be more on the optimization side of things. I mean, optimization side, I believe, I mean, it's a bit of an abstract, right? It's a bit of an artifact right now that everybody uses deep learning frameworks, of course. 
Um, but of course, you can tailor, if you're implementing an optimizer yourself and tailor it in CUDA, right? You can, you can get a lot of performance. It just takes you an incredible amount of effort figuring it out. <laughs> okay, thank you, Maria. Thank yeah, you're welcome. And any other questions? Hey, uh, I have a question. Hey. Hey. Um, so in this framework uh, for neural rendering, you have some thoughts on how you could integrate uh, human perceptual capabilities or psychophysics, because some people are sensitive to certain artifacts and you know can be fooled easily. Uh, maybe optimizing for all the parameters may not be worth uh, for the returns that it gives. Do you have any thoughts? Thank you. Uh, good question. Well, I mean, the whole the whole problem starts with giving me a 2D image is a projection of some sort of higher dimensional 3D space plus material lighting and, and, material, and everything else, right? So, so that, that is a, you have a lower dimensionality, it's under constraint, you have to go back in some way. So you need some priors, right? And one argument is you have face models, these priors are there, and the other argument is you, you learn these priors and so on. And the same counts, of course, with neural rendering, you have the same problems there too. Um, but the ultimate hope is, of course, you're learning the under constraintness or to combat it um, with enough data, right? If I have enough data, I can probably do it. Um, but in practice, you're going to be right. In practice, you, you can't optimize for all of them at the same time. You probably have to focus on one or the other. You can say, oh, I'm going to optimize only um, for, for the animations part and so on. But I think in order to really solve the problem, everything has to be right. So even when we did face-to-face -face at that time, when we didn't get the lighting right, everything else failed because the appearance didn't match with the target, right? So as long as you don't have the full image synthesis model running, at least for the targets you're going to go for, um, nothing will work because your, your comparisons in 2D will fail. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to go for everything, but in practice, you're going to go to like restricted domains, you're going to learn some priors, you're going to cheat a little bit with using feature, traditional features to, to get a good alignment in the optimization first, right? And then you're starting closer to your optimum. These are things that will help, but it's, a, it's an interesting problem. Another interesting problem is at the moment, we mostly do it on a single video sequence, right? So we're kind of abusing deep learning frameworks as an optimization. Um, but learning the priors on a larger scale across sequences is a challenging thing that I haven't seen too much. I mean, that's, I mean, of course, I've seen it like there's like progressive GAN and these kind of papers, they do that. But they, again, they're also in a very constrained domain. You know, they have to align every image with respect to the eyes and nose and stuff like that. Um, but it will, it will get more and more relaxed, right? I mean, we do make progress. We're getting a bit more insight how to optimize the networks. We're getting also more insights how to incorporate known priors into the networks and don't need so much training data anymore. So, you know, globally, I don't know, as the community is doing SGD, right? We're making progress in random directions. <laughs> Well, thank you. Any, any other questions? Okay, if, if there are no more questions, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Matthias. It, again, it was, it was a really uh, great talk and reminder that, that the talk will, uh, will be recorded. Yeah, okay. I've been recorded and we'll post it. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. See you guys. Bye bye.